welcome to the audience of ambedkar karwan and uh, we are sorry we are a bit late because as you know that there are there is a connectivity issue in uh, in kolkata our our our, our speaker today karthik comes from kolkata and uh, as we know that the cyclone amphan has destroyed wrecked a lot of infrastructure in the city of uh, kolkata and it took uh, some time for us to go live and we 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 are sorry for being late but i think it's worth waiting for this very interesting uh, lecture today by uh, dear friend kartik ram manoharan who has a very amazing uh, career he is a political scientist who is based in kolkata at uh, the center for studies in social sciences he has written a, a, a very interesting book as we know that there is this great african uh, african um, uh, activist we look up to and try to learn from french fanon and he has written a book on him titled as identity and resistance and it was published in 2019 by the oriental black swan he is also co co-editor of rethinking social justice uh he he co-edited uh, a book which was also published this year only and uh, he is currently working on the political thought of periyar ev ramaswamy so i think you know what we are trying to do through ambedkar karwan is to uh, is to bring in our our heroes from all over the places understand their ideologies thoughts and i think kartik uh, kartik welcome to uh, ambedkar karwan Thank you. Thank you so much for providing me this platform to yeah, we, talk uh, about yeah, this important topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, Karthik has been like putting a lot of energies to understand uh, the 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 strands of thoughts of Baba Sahib Ambedkar and uh, Periyar, and he's trying to construct how the 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 uh, Dalit Bhojan solidarity can be constructed out of it. So his topic today is Periyar and Baba Sahib Ambedkar. towards imagining a dalit bahujan solidarity so without taking much time i request my dear friend uh, kartik to take over thank you very much uh, dear friend uh, and uh, i uh, am, am, am i i uh, let me just first apologize for being a bit late as mangesh said there are some connectivity issues but i'm really glad to be speaking to all of you here through the platform of ambedkar karawan and i'm uh, really thankful that such an initiative exists to connect us uh, people across the world in this uh, troubling uh, times uh, so let me just uh, jump into the topic um why talk about dalit bahujan solidarity right uh, as many of you would know that uh, this concept of uh, dalit bahujan solidarity was uh, theorized to a great extent Uh, in my ex in my opinion by one of the most greatest political leaders of india uh, kanchi ram ji uh, it is uh, in his uh, legacy and it is in his tradition that many of us scholars today try to engage with this question of, of what does it mean to be a dalit bahujan political subject uh, because this is bringing to crucial constituencies together which makes them a powerful majority right so this is not about talking about uh, victimhood or identity grievances but it is coming together of a majority to the purposes of capturing political power and to effect social uh, economic and cultural transformation through this right so fundamentally dalit bahujan question is a question of politics and it is not just a question of cultural identity and when we talk about dalit bahujan solidarity it means expanding one's borders and one's boundaries beyond one's own identity into a larger community of the oppressed right which constitute the majority in india now having said that let us go back to some of the basics and our basics the basics for dalit bahujan politics comes of course from uh, mahatma phule baba saheb ambedkar and periyari v ramasamy for the purpose of today's talk i will restrict my focus to the interaction of the thoughts of 
Periyar and Baba Sahib Ambedkar. Right? Now, uh, the people who are watching this are most familiar with Baba Sahib Ambedkar and many of you are definitely better experts than I am on his uh, thoughts and his life and his work. But uh, for those who are not uh, very familiar with Periyar, let me just give a sort of a very uh, broad outline. Um, see, Periyar was uh, active for the period of uh, 90, from the early 1920s till 1973, right? So he had more than 50 years of uh, activism in public and political life. Now, over the period of time, Periyar's uh, uh, political alliances, right? And his political affiliations have changed, right? Initially, he starts off as a Congress activist, right? But in 1925, uh, disagreeing with the, the Congress uh, policy to not encourage proportionate representation for backward communities, he breaks off from the Congress. So he opposes the Congress for opposing uh, proportionate representation. So he was a very vocal advocate of proportionate representation for backward communities from the 1920s onwards, right? Uh, one of the very crucial moments in Periyar's political life in, the, in, in this period uh, comes from two things. One is the Vaikom agitations, where he fought for the rights of the backward communities to use the public roads near in, in, in a temple in Vaikom in Kerala. That brought him national attention. In fact, uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar also writes that this was a very inspiring moment for him, this Vaikom agitation. And the other important moment in Periyar's political life is a support to uh, uh, Baba Sahib uh, Ambedkar view for separate electorates, right? So Periyar was one of the very prominent and in fact rare South Indian leaders to have supported Baba Sahib Ambedkar's demand for separate electorates. In the run-up to the Pune Pact, the, the Periyar's party paper, the Kudi Arasir, published some 40 articles or so in support of Ambedkar. And he vocally criticizes Gandhi's positions to deny separate electorates for the Dalit communities. Right? After that, there have been several interactions between uh, Periyar and Ambedkar. Unfortunately, not much of this has been documented very clearly. Uh, in, in an attempt to bring out the sort of interaction, the interactions between Periyar and Ambedkar's thoughts, uh, I had recently published an article on the Journal of South Asian History and Culture called In the Path of Ambedkar, Periyar and the Dalit Question. Now, this, uh, in this paper, which was published on South Asian History and Culture in, uh, on, on uh, April 2020, I trace the evolution of Periyar's views as regards the Dalit question through his engagement with Ambedkar's thoughts, right? Now, and I maintain that Periyar always placed Dalit empowerment and liberation as a central plank of his Dravidian project, okay? And also that he supported both secular and religious forms of Dalit militancy. I will come to this very shortly, okay? But why is this important to talk of that? Mainly because of certain criticisms which have been placed on Periyar in the past few years. Now, as regards as criticisms of, that have been placed on Periyar, we can uh, broadly divide them into four phases, right? So in the first phase, Periyar was accused of being anti-national, right? So he was accused of being a British stooge. He was accused of uh, opposing uh, Indian independence. He was accused of uh, being a traitor, being a chamcha, this, that, and so on, right? Uh, they said that he was paid by the British to disrupt the national movement in India, and etc., etc., okay? Uh, in the second, uh, the second phase of criticism on Periyar was that uh, he did not understand 
the Hindu religion, right? So people got offended by the sort of criticism which Periyar Pere placed on Hinduism and especially the manner in which he did it. And they made accusations that uh, Periyar was anti-Hindu, that he was a Christian agent, that he was paid by the church, that he was doing propaganda for Islam, and also that, uh, you know, he hadn't read the Upanishads, he didn't read the Ramayana, he didn't read Mahabharata, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in the third phase, around the 70s or something, uh, people started accusing Periyar of being anti-communist, right? They said that Periyar was an agent of the landlords, that he did not pay attention to the workers question, that he did not give due attention to the class question, that uh, Periyar uh, was actually a, 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 a reactionary thinker in favor of uh, big capitalists and the landowning elite. This was the third phase of criticism. Now, when you look at it over the years, from the 1920s when, when uh, till the 1970s, when Periyar was alive and active, he was around to give counters to these criticisms. And after that, uh, a set of dedicated Periyarist activists and academics have also been countering such criticism. And I think they have done a pretty good job of it. But from the 90s onwards, especially after the rise of Dalit movements in Tamil Nadu, which became much stronger in the 90s, there was this new frame of criticism which was launched against Periyar, which is that he was anti-Dalit, right? So among the many criticisms which were placed are firstly that uh, Periyar did not pay attention to the Dalit question, Periyar did not... Uh, uh, give uh, adequate importance to it, that it was only marginal to the Dravidian project, that Periyar did not engage with Ambedkar at all and that he had no regard for him. And finally, that Periyar was only supporting the intermediate caste at the expense of the Dalits. Now, I have given the names of a few scholars who have placed such criticisms in my journal article. You can have a look at it yourself. But generally, the idea is that the Dalit concern was not an issue of concern to Periyar at all, right? Now, before I go into this, there is actually a funny thing which you might notice. Now, I told you that uh, uh, there are four phases of criticism, right? That Periyar was anti-Hindu, Periyar was anti-national, Periyar was anti-communist, and Periyar was anti-Dalit. When you look at it, the people who are placing these criticisms over a period of, period of time more or less come from the same social caste background. So the same people from the same particular elite social caste background who once said that Periyar was anti-Hindu, later said that Periyar was anti-national, later that he was anti-communist, have now started to say that Periyar is anti-Dalit, right? Uh, because it appears that uh, it, it, has, it has become a task of these uh, elite uh, academics, uh, writers, journalists, and also some uh, unknown novelists and uh, translators and so on, to prove that Periyar was anti-Dalit and to somehow try to save the Dalits from Periyar, right? So just as there is this theory of, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, in, in post-colonial studies, the white man trying to save the brown woman from the brown man, we should also probably start to theorize why Brahmins want to save Dalits from Periyar and, you know, other Dravidian leaders. That would be an interesting project to work on. But anyway, jokes apart, um, this criticism is has been placed and it is a bit of a dominant trend at the moment to reject Periyar by appropriating the Dalit question and by using it against him. But what I would uh, say from uh, not just empirical or historical evidence, but from the evidence of Periyar's own writings, is that to Periyar, the emancipation of the Dravidian community or the Bahujan community, the intermediate caste, the OBCs, the MBCs, and so on, is absolutely impossible without 
having an autonomous Dalit militant movement, right? So as early as the 1920s, Periyar is um, very strongly advocating for special provisions to be given to have reserved posts for Dalits in employment, in education, in government services, and most importantly, in the police, right? So he says that as long as, you know, the power of police and uh, uh, in the armed forces is in the hands of the upper caste or even the intermediate caste, Dalit atrocities are likely to continue and which is why you need to have greater Dalit representation in these sort of posts. Likewise, he also says that the entire village economy should be rearranged in such a manner that <coughs> land and other traditional forms of social power in the villages must be taken away from the elite non-Brahmin caste and be given over to the Dalits, right? So he actually says that the traditional jobs of villages, which are being done by, uh, you know, communities like the Gounders, the Mudaliyas, Pillais, etc., should be taken away and should be given to the Dalits so that they can feel empowered in the village as well, right? Then he, he, he is advocating a form of modern education for the Dalit communities so that they can break the shackles of what he felt was a caste-based traditional Hindu education. In the 1920s, it's also interesting that uh, Periyar was one of a very vocal supporter of conversion to Islam, right? Because there were certain uh, uh, isolated clashes, anti-Dalit clashes in Tamil Nadu, and at that time, he responds by telling that, uh, see, Hinduism is never going to give you an equal space, right? He's telling the Dalits, you know, Hinduism is never going to give you an equal space. Um, and it is always going to recognize you as an inferior. But whereas in Islam, there is the possibility of being part of a broader egalitarian community. And if there are some critics who say that Islam is violent, then so be it. You know, it is better to be violent than to be submissive. And he's encouraging the Dalits to convert to Islam and to hit back if anyone hits at them, right? Uh, now, this is a period in the 20s, but we should also uh, re remember that in the 1930s, he's also criticizing uh, some of the, what he felt, some of the backward practices in Islam. And he is, in fact, trying to look at Islam as a sort of a modern religion rather than just a sort of a traditional, uh, you know, uh, typical faith-based religion. So he is trying to look at the possibility of conversion to Islam so as to enter society not as religious subjects, but as modern subjects with a sense of equality and equal rights. Okay, But... I would say Periyar's greater interest as far as religions were concerned was towards Buddhism, right? And the influence of Baba Sahib Ambedkar is pretty much uh, obvious uh, over here. Uh, so uh, in, in, uh, 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 in the 40s, uh, Periyar travels to uh, just a second. No, okay. So Periyar uh, travels to Burma in 1954 to the World Buddhist Conference, uh, reportedly because uh, Ambedkar desired uh, that uh, Periyar also participate in this uh, World Buddhist Conference. So over here, when he when he when he meets Ambedkar, the uh, observers record that there was a general feeling of warmth and congeniality between them. And both of them express similar forms of opinions as regards the potential of uh, uh, Buddhism is concerned. Now, uh, Ambedkar calls Buddhism a philosophy of reason. And uh, Periyar also says that Buddhism is nothing except rationalism at its purest. So Periyar views Buddhism not as a religion, but as a sort of a rational 
scientific and a humane way of living life right and he believes that by conversion to buddhism not only the dalits but also the bahujan majority can reclaim what was lost to them which is not only their identity but also their humanity and also a possibility of engaging with the world as rational citizens and not as irrational slaves to a caste order so we can see that he is looking at conversion both as a form of direct physical resistance and also as a form of social and intellectual emancipation over here uh, 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 like as i said his obvious uh, tilt his greater tilt is towards buddhism and he overlaps with ambedkar on several thoughts as regarding buddhism and so on now i've already talked about his uh, importance which periyar gives to proportional representation right mm -hmm. um uh, but what what is significant over here is that uh, periyar is uh, consistently uh, criticizing the intermediate caste right so he is consistently criticizing the intermediate caste for their refusal to treat uh, the dalits as their equal and for looking up to the brahmins as their superiors right so ambedkar uh, famously said right the caste mentality is a ascending scale of reverence and a descending scale of contempt right so periyar tells that in a much more you know you know in it makes the same statement in a much more cruder fashion and he says that you know caste like vanyars and devars would prefer to be slaves to the brahmans than to be equals with the dalits right so he is uh, criticizing this communities in the harshest of terms for their refusal to find a common cause or solidarity with the dalits okay so for instance he uh, 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 there is this um, meeting of the one years which he addresses now the one years are a very interesting community they uh, they are the single largest caste in tamil nadu they make up something around 12 to 13 percentage of tamil nadu's population they are highly economic economically and socially backward and um, there is this uh, very good book by an satanadan called simply speaking a sudra story where he documents that for a long time one years were slave laborers right for a long period of time in history one years were slave laborers and their position was only slightly better than that of the dalits in history but in the past 100 years the one years in order to seek social mobility started calling themselves vanya kula kshatriyas that is one years belonging to the kshatriya community <clears throat> this happened during periyar time periyar's time itself as early as uh, 1890 or something itself the one year sangams started claiming that they were part of the kshatriya community now when uh, once when periyar was addressing a meeting of one years he is um, he 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 points out to their economic backwardness he points out to the social backwardness he tells that look at the condition which you are it is only slightly better than that of the dalits and therefore you should come together to fight the system of brahmanism right instead what he is actually mocking the one years he is saying that instead what you fellows are doing is that you are content to be on a much lower level to the brahmins right by being kshatriyas or whatever instead of fighting for equality of all you are consenting to be inferior to someone else just so that you can be superior to someone else right and then he says he tells them that uh, he thinks that the kshatriyas are a most disgraceful and degraded form of human beings right because they have sold their conscience and their rational thinking to the brahmanical system so he says he tells the vanyars to break out of this fascination of being kshatriyas and to find common cause with the dalits and to fight for equality and freedom from the system of brahmanism likewise he is he is also 
continuously making uh, uh, you know making fun and criticizing uh, intermediate caste communities and what was remarkably bold is that he would be the chief guest at the caste conferences of such communities let's say he'll go to the nadar community uh, as a chief guest in uh, tuticon or to a devar conference in madurai or to a one year conference in uh, dharmapuri he'll go to this caste conferences of intermediate caste and he'll make fun of them right periyar would go to these sort of caste conferences and ridicule them for their sense of superiority over dalits and for willing to be inferior to the brahmin right so at all of these meetings periyar is consistently trying to articulate a form of dalit bahujan solidarity which would create them as a form of a dravidian community and what he means by a dravidian community is that a person who is asteless who defends egalitarianism who defends women's rights who defends the rights of workers rights of oppressed nationalities and so on basically de peria's conception of the dravidian community is a community of the oppressed <laughs> right so this community of the oppressed again which which has uh, 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 as uh, 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 you know kanchiram sahib uh, imagine is the community of the majority now in in contemporary terms of uh, social theory especially left wing populism we call this as the people versus the elite right so uh, the theorist ernesto laclau for instance defends this forms of articulation you know this broad coalition of you know different interest groups coming together as people as opposed to the elite you know this form of left wing populism has been of much interest to theorists in the west of late but uh, significantly without theorizing it periyar was in some uh, perhaps unconscious way articulating this form of a populism right you know this sort of all sort of marginal communities and oppressed communities coming together to create the majority and to oppose the elite a crucial political sentiment which informed this was the spirit of solidarity now why is the spirit of solidarity uh, important um let me just go to certain basics of uh, uh, ambedkar right uh, so because uh, i think this sort of uh, baba sahib's framework gives the sort of a broader intellectual atmosphere in which these sort of thoughts of broader solidarities uh, emerge now see uh, to baba saheb of course he is uh, believes in the necessity of the dalit bahujan thinkers to start intellectually criticizing brahmanism and caste oppression right now um, when, uh, as ambedkar says the brahman would never interrogate the nature of caste oppression because and i quote him the brahman scholar is only a learned man he is not an intellectual the former is class conscious and is alive to the interests of his class the latter is an emancipated being who is free to act without being swayed by class considerations in other words baba saheb is telling ambedkar is telling that uh, the brahman is incapable of objective scholarship now he identifies inequality as the official doctrine of the hindu religion and he says that the hindu has no will to equality baba saheb did not view untouchability alone as the excess of hinduism you know you know you know gandhi for instance believed that uh, the oh, bad thing with hinduism was untouchability and if you remove untouchability hinduism could be reformed right but uh, baba saheb's radicalism was in acknowledging and recognizing that untouchability alone is not an excess of hinduism he ambedkar saw inequality as the fundamental essence of brahmanism which was coded into all rituals and practices of hinduism in hinduism he saw and i quote him a gospel of darkness where inequality is a religious doctrine
Karthik, you there? As I said, there is some problem uh, of internet in, in Calcutta because of the Ampan. We will wait for Kartik to be back because you know the lecture is wonderful, wonderful lecture. So we'll just uh, wait for some time for Kartik to come. Welcome back, Karthik. Net connection is terrible. No, no, no problem, no problem. Please, please, please carry on. Go forth. Okay. So I'm unmuted, right? No, yeah, I am unmuted. You are, you are audible. Oh, I'm audible. Oh, okay, fine. So, uh, okay. So, so uh, to just go back to the point. So, uh, as in everyone's familiar, you know, uh, that uh, about Baba Sahib's this idea that caste system is not just a division of laborers, but a graded division of laborers, you know, where one are placed above the other. So not only are the laborers divided by caste, they are also placed in graded particularistic identities, which denies them the possibility of a long-term political solidarity to wage common struggles, whether it be for politics or for socioeconomic reasons. We, we can say that the ideology of Brahminism prevents the emergence of any radical politics that would supersede the particularism of caste by a broad universalism that can imagine a larger form of community. So, taking from Baba Sahib, we can define Brahmanism as an ideology, a system of graded inequality that seals caste in particularist identities and uh, uh, prevents the emergence of any form of radical, broad, universalistic politics that could challenge the system. So Brahmanism cannot be just reduced to the obvious acts of you know, direct violence, intercaste violence, riots, and so on and so forth. But uh, it is also the very, very more subtle forms of uh, 
relations which structures our identities our relationship with the system and our relationships with each other so so you might see that uh, uh, in the in the, in the after the 90s onwards all of a sudden indian upper caste liberals discovered caste and everyone became a dalit expert right everyone you know nowadays if you might i mean if i to that risk of uh, being exaggerating nowadays i guess more than uh, the dalits themselves it is uh, the upper caste academic who is most interested in dalit studies because uh, dalit studies has uh, not just become a separate discipline it has become a sort of a business opportunity for many sorts of uh, privileged well established uh, academics but one of the which is which is see it's it's not necessarily wrong i'm not trying to say that uh, you know um, <clears throat> the elite should not uh, study this they should not do research and so on but when we look at the content of the research right the manner in which certain questions are posed that we find several problems right you know the slovenian uh, philosopher slavoj zizek he says that uh, you know uh, we shouldn't try to problematize answers but we should try to problematize questions right so are we asking the right questions hmm? that is the point so when we look at elite academics who are working on dalit studies are they asking the right questions hmm? so when they reduce the caste question or when they reduce the caste oppression to the question of what the violence which dalits alone face aren't they just being another form of gandians this is just reproducing what gandhi did you know making the caste question into a system of uh, you know you know sympathy towards the dalits you know calling them harijans calling them uh, this that and so on getting them some place in the seva ashram and whatever now instead of that what you have are uh, you know you call them dalit uh, studies you uh, you give them a fellowship you say that oh look uh, you know non brahmins are the baton holders of brahmanism it's obcs who are your primary enemies and so on and so forth so you know you create a sort of a narrative where you just focus on direct forms of violence okay so for instance if there is a, a the marathas who are rioting against the dalits or it's the vanniers who are rioting against the dalits there is absolutely no doubt that this should be unconditionally condemned in the strongest possible terms there is no doubt on that but this alone does not determine what caste is this does not give you any insights into the nature of the caste system so what is this question that we are asking so this uh, this this framing of new questions this framing of questions which would challenge the system is what in my opinion great thinkers like mahatma phule baba saheb and periyar have taught the dalit bahujans right and it is this intellectual legacy which i believe must be recovered and reinvented if we are to reimagine a politics of dalit bahujan solidarity i strongly believe that uh, um in the in the past few years particularly uh, there has been a new flowering of interest in periyar's thoughts now there is mm, i mean i think we we are very pretty much in a point to say that there is no one who can dispute the intellectual status of ambedkar anymore right baba saheb has not just become a national figure he has become an international figure there are you know foreign uh, uh, publishers and there are you know foreign academics like uh, professor jafalot professor dag eric berg uh, professor meena danda um, you know uh, gail ombet you know who has done so much work you know all of these people have done remarkable work absolutely remarkable work engaging with the thoughts of uh, uh, baba saheb ambedkar but but in the last few years there has been that sort of a movement towards periyar as well right uh, only because many of periyar's works are coming to light only now 
Now the vast majority of these works are in Tamil. It's really a pity. I think that they should be translated as soon as possible into English so that they reach an audience outside Tamil Nadu. Because I think that Periyar is not a property of Tamils at all. He should be seen as a property of the Dalit, Bahujans and all oppressed communities as such. Right? So in this aspect, I feel very sad that the people in the Dravidian movement have not taken this initiative to, you know, translate more of his works. Uh, Professor Aloysius has done some remarkable work in translating some texts of Periyar, but I hope this becomes a more broader attempt. But what I want to say is that in academia, there has been a reviving or a greater interest in going back to the original works of Periyar and trying to bring them to life. Mine is also a small contribution to this effort. Why this is important is because this brings a sort of a confluence of important thinkers, an entire intellectual trajectory of Dalit Bahujan thinking of identity, emancipation, and enlightenment, right? This, I think, can constitute the only truly counter-hegemonic intellectual and political force that we need in this time. And it can lay the intellectual foundation for the politics of a Dalit Bahujan solidarity. On that positive note, I end and I thank you all again for uh, uh, being here and listening to us. I hope all of you are safe and keeping healthy. Jai Bhim, Jai Pari. Arthik, that was a wonderful, wonderful lecture and your energy and the way you articulate uh, the ideas. I think they are very important and they need to be widely uh, listened to and also people need to talk about these things because I think openness and more communication channels between the various movements that we see around and you know how we can exchange those ideas, how we can exchange the thoughts, how we can exchange even the legacies of great people. I think we can do a lot. There are a lot of questions actually, and uh, we will go into some of this. Uh, like uh, there is a question that uh, uh, now we are in the in the in the 2020, and we have this a lot of issues about the the Sanskritization and 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 the growing Hindu nationalism. Can you hear mm -hmm. me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, huh. And which is like which has become like a behemoth, which is eating everything mm -hmm. on its way. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, uh, how do we look at the solidarity hmm. between the Dalits and the Bhujans or, you know, traditionally what in the fullest term, uh, shudra, ati shudra. how do we hmm. look at uh, that hmm. kind of a solidarity in the, in the, in the contemporary context? Hmm. Okay. So um, before, how, before looking at wow, how should we look at, let me first start by saying that this is probably the only force, this Dalit Bahujan solidarity, which I feel can stop Hindu nationalism. I don't think anything else, right? I don't think anything else in this country, whether it be the left sort of articulation or whether it be the liberal feminist, blah, 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 sort of articulation, which can stop it. I think that only a Dalit Bahujan solidarity and other forms of progressive forces, which you know, auxiliaries to this Dalit Bhujan solidarity can stop uh, Hindu uh, nationalism and majoritarianism. Why? Because Dalit Bhujan thinking is the reinvention of the majority, right? Hindu nationalism wants to posit Hindus, a broad sort of a term, as a majority, while Dalit Bhujan criticism completely deconstructs this from within and says that no. It is the Dalit Bahujans who are the majority, right? So this is, this is not just a challenge of Hindu nationalism. This is a long-term project which looks at the majority in a completely different and in an egalitarian way, in an inclusive way, in a way that can promise and guarantee a sort of emancipation of anyone who is being part of the Dalit Bahujan community. Now, I'll just give one case study of why and where this was important. Uh, in the 2019 elections, you know that uh, the BJP won across several states with a huge majority, right? True, true, true. But in the state of Tamil Nadu, they were not able to win a single seat, true. mainly because of this Dalit Bahujan coalition, right? What is this Dalit Bahujan coalition? This coalition between the 
DMK and the VCK. DMK right. led by MK Stalin, VCK led by uh, Dr. Thirma Valavan. The This sort of effective coming together of forces, mm -hmm. right? This effective coming together of Dalit and Bahujan forces to fight against right. the sort of Hindu nationalism through constitutional means. Tamil Nadu 2019 was a perfect case study, right? right? So I think that this sort of uh, solidarities must be worked over and thought about in other parts of India as well. Right. I definitely think that it is feasible and desirable. Right, right, right. Um, uh, you discussed about uh, uh, Piriyar's uh, affination, love for Buddhism, and he attended several conferences. And we know that uh, there has been this uh, great Buddhist movement launched by Panditar Avichitas. Yeah. And uh, we know that uh, Buddhism has been, you know, a part of uh, Tamil uh, identity for a long time. And we know that the word like Tamil and Tamil and Dravid, they actually are the same words as Baba Sahabedkar has written in one of his books. So the question is, you know, like the conversion is, the, is, the, is of essence because people need to come out of that container of Brahminism. And if mm. they stay in the Hindu fold, uh, their emancipation is not possible. And therefore, in the initial days of the, you know, the Dravidian movement, there was a, 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 a trace on uh, Buddhism. Also in the movies, which were inspired by the Dravidian movement, they had Buddha here and there, like, you know, symbolically. Mm. Mm. So how do you see, how, how do you look at this in the contemporary times, like Dravidian movements? Are they, are they thinking about Buddhism or, you know, what is the status of that? See, when we look at the established uh, political parties, uh, I would say that they have, uh, you know, they 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 have not uh, thought about this to a great extent, right? So right. it is a pity that uh, largely the, the the primacy is given to politics, Polit society, and economics. Right. But religion, they have just said that okay, we will not talk about. It, okay. Mm -hmm. So we will not support Hinduism, we will not, uh, you know, attack it either. That has been the sort of a tactical response of, uh, uh, I would say, both Dravidian and Dalit parties in Tamil Nadu for a long time. And uh, uh, But there is a very enriching conversation on Buddhism, which is happening at an intellectual sphere, right? right. I personally think that it should uh, translate into a larger sort of a cultural movement. Right? right. I think this 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 uh, uh, this bringing back of uh, Pandit Ayodhidas, right, mm -hmm. and trying to again connect it with other forms of emancipatory forms of Buddhism in other parts of India. I think this is the perfect time to talk about it in an intellectual and cultural sphere. What political impact this might have, I'm not sure. Okay, so this this we can't calculate or predict the intellect. Right. The, the, of these sort of things, but I definitely think at a cultural sphere, this conversation is important to have. Uh, at, but at some level, I think uh, you know, artists like uh, Ranjit, for instance, P. Ranjit, mm -hmm. he is trying to popularize this through cinema, which I think is an in, uh, initiative, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like uh, those growing up in, in, in North India, uh, one of the books uh, among the Bhaujan movement that is read is Satchi Ramayan. Mm -hmm. You know, that's by, uh, by, uh, by uh, Yvier, Yvier uh, Ramaswamy. Uh, yeah. Can you tell the audience from North India, uh, uh, such other books are written uh, by Periyar, you know, that would uh, uh, inflate the balloon of the Brahminical mythology and, you know, Brahminical a propaganda of falsehood? Okay. Uh, so the thing is that, uh, see, um, uh, Periyar has written almost uh, 11 volumes on religion. Okay. But now all of these are in Tamil. Hmm? But uh, there are some books which you should definitely read, which have been published by uh, Critical Quest, right? Okay. This is uh, Periyar on Islam. Okay. Uh, Periyar on uh, Buddhism. Yeah. Uh, well, both of these books are edited by uh, G. Aloysius. Mm -hmm. And um, there is this uh, essay by uh, Paula Richman, which mm -hmm. looked at uh, uh, Periyar's views on the Ramayana. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, there is this uh, publication called the uh, collected works of periyar evr which mm -hmm. has been published by the dravidar karagam okay it's a, it's a, it's a thick book but uh, it's a, the title is wrong it says that it is a collected works of periyar but it is actually a very very small selected works because periyar's works run to more than 38 volumes this is actually this should be called only a selected works but in this book which is written in english there are some of his criticisms made on uh, hindu religion brahmanism and so on and um, uh, apart from that if you look at the catalog of critical quest right mm -hmm. there are several uh, other books by periyar which have been translated for instance i would say a very important book is uh, uh, women and slave right which talks that's about that's how... a question for you next question for you you know that is like do yeah. you think the role of women in both periyar and ambedkar debates are extremely important very very important very important right see because uh, this is something which uh, many uh, you know um, uh, people who engage with Peri periyar do not acknowledge is that uh, periyar was also speaking some radical things which uh, feminists in western countries started speaking only in the 1960s and 70s right 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 as uh, you know in the 1920s and 30s itself this man is telling women to break away from families you know to have uh, uh, you know to lead their lives in their own free way they wa want to have an equal share in the economy to have equal share in property most importantly to come together to fight brahmanism and casteism right so as you know he saw dalit empowerment and emancipation as one of the central pillars he is also viewing women's liberation as a very important pillar of uh, dalit bahujan emancipation now this is significant because as i told you right in 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 my uh, lecture that uh, you know he goes to uh, caste conferences and he makes uh, fun of the caste who is addressing yeah, yeah. one notion of superiority yeah. but he is also when he is addressing you know uh uh bahujan communities or dalit communities he also keeps criticizing them for their patriarchy and uh, misogyny hmm? uh -huh. so you know because this is particularly important because uh, there are some uh, people who are you know you know who uh, easily dismiss the sort of conversation on gender which was happening in dalit bahujan communities and among dalit bahujan leaders i mean uh, when we look at it ideally um, uh savitri bai phule right and uh, mahatma jyoti rao phule the sort of things which they did for the women's movement in india was unparalleled especially considering that point of time right what baba saheb and periyar did for women's movement was also unparalleled but when did the indian mainstream feminists started engaging with these thinkers right so so that that question is there because again i say that dalit bahujan intellectual thinking needs to re not just reclaim mm -hmm. needs to initiate and be the originators of the conversation of gender in this country because it has been dalit bahujan thinkers who have been most concerned with gender equality in history right 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 uh karthik maybe we are uh, heading towards the last question but i think this is a very important question yeah. in the movement we talk about the intellectual things exchanging ideas and you know uh, exchanging thoughts i uh, you know and, and strategies methods so on and so forth that's important but also what is important is to have the very deep friendships across mm -hmm. the the leaderships and across the communities and uh, one of the mm -hmm. things that we when, when we talk about the people like periyar or baba saheb ambedkar we don't talk about you know bone homey between them the friendship and love between them can you tell us like you know how baba saheb ambedkar and periyar met and you know how how many times it's just a like uh, very i i find it very interesting question you know and you know what was the level of friendship between them like we have an evidence that shahu maharaj and uh, baba saheb were very close like friends and like brothers mm. to each other they could they could mm. work on anything together because of that kind of a uh, trust and love between them so mm. how you know please tell us about this friendship between these two great people okay um 
I think the first time Periyar met Ambedkar was in uh, January 1940 in Mumbai. Right. So uh, over there, um, he had first a personal conversation with uh, Ambedkar, and then later they both addressed a meeting jointly. Right. And uh, both of the in in the meeting, both of them criticized Brahminism in the strongest terms. Right. So, for instance, Periyar said that uh, Congress promoted Brahminism to the detriment of all communities, and Baba Sahib Ambedkar complimented him by saying that Brahminism was the real curse of in, uh, India. Right. Um, throughout, uh, Periyar always refers to Baba Sahib in very congenial terms and also in a spirit of deference, as in he is recognizing Ambedkar. as the greatest intellectual of the whole of india right so again uh, periyar meets ambedkar again in 1944 when uh, baba saheb came to chennai right so over where uh, baba saheb in principle right in principle he supports the idea of a dravidian federation of you know non brahmin communities and the empowerment of non brahmin communities which uh, periyar was talking about right and uh, i i i think then again the last time the two thinkers met was in 1954 in burma up in the world buddhist conference where i told you that they you know shared similar views and so on now um <clears throat> all of these uh, incidents as in um, they have not been properly documented as in they should have been elaborately documented on but there are only fragments which we get from history but from what the fragments which we get and from the works of periyar which uh, talk about uh, baba saheb we can understand that there was a great deal of comradeship mutual respect and friendship between the two thinkers in india okay between the two thinkers okay so when baba saheb passed away uh, it is very significant that periyar urged all of the tamils not just the dalits he urged all of the tamils to nindar as ambedkar after ambedkar because he felt that baba saheb was not just a leader for the dalits but for all oppressed communities in india right and i'll just end with a sort of a quote about uh, which which we were just a very small quote on uh, baba saheb um periyar says which which sort of captures what he thought about him mm -hmm. there is no equal to dr ambedkar in india and uh, this is the opinion i would say periyar had on ambedkar from the 1930s till the point when periyar passed away that there is no equal to dr ambedkar in india wow kartik that was a very very beautiful lecture and uh, the way you articulated and the, the the way you you your energy gets reflected to your your talk is so admirable thank you it's lovely thank you thank you so much yeah you are welcome and it's lovely to have you and we are looking forward to more engagements like this in the future and uh, i think that uh, we need to have more such discussions between our 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 leaders all over the country bring them you know bring their thoughts together bring their relationship with each other together so that we as you talked about the dalit bahujan solidarity you know we 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 pave a way because that's the only ideology which is going to uh you know save this country to use the Absolutely. word Absolutely. only mm -hmm. only ideology which is going to save this country and by implication save the humanity mm -hmm. so i think uh, that's a beautiful beautiful uh, uh, talk we had and thank you for answering the questions and thank, thank you, you. and i just want please, to say something take, 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 take. Uh, i i i should also thank you first not only for inviting me here but for the remarkable work you are doing on uh, ambedkar caravan i think it's a very important forum i wish you your supporters your speakers and everyone who's following the page the very best of luck and wish you to have more such events and more such meetings in the future thank, thank you so much for uh, having this space for us thank you thank you kartik and we will we 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 will be uh, live tomorrow as well we are bringing in a a, a talk by 
a very very erudite scholar uh, gajendran ayathurai who has done a remarkable work on uh, uh, pandit aitihas and he is going to take us through lot of different uh, dimensions and i think this is one of the very important lectures that you should you, we should all listen to absolutely and, and we are all looking forward absolutely. to and also there is a pravin kumar who is going to come in the afternoon joining with sonika bodhi so please be there and uh, until then definitely goodbye thank you sure thank you very much